Good morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with another video. This is going to be a comprehensive deep dive based on uh, my experience, both my professional experience before AI and my consulting experience uh, now that I am an AI specialist. So today's topic is knowledge management, uh, specifically when vector search alone is not enough. So if you're watching this video, I'm imagining that these are some of the problems you're facing. You've built a chatbot or some other similar uh, generative AI tool, probably with the ChatGPT API or similar API. It can do some stuff. You've cut your teeth. You've got your feet wet on this technology. Uh, it can do some things very well, but you're you know working on figuring out how to steer these things. Uh, you even have some integrations. Maybe you've figured out how to you know have dynamically composed prompts. You've done search augmentation, uh, and then maybe you're even using you know API calls and that sort of thing. But you're finding really profound limitations because on its own, operating in a vacuum, these chatbots and other tools, they're really kind of useless because they don't have the context of the rest of your organization or other context of the of whatever task or pipeline that it's in and that sort of thing. So you've got constraints on window size. How do you keep it from hallucinating? Uh, how do you keep it grounded? And so basically now you have a sad little lost robot and you need to figure out how to teach it to get to the next level. So here's a little bit about me. Uh, I was an enterprise IT infrastructure engineer for about 15 years. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, IT infrastructure, we work with basically everyone. Network security database, software, enterprise architects. Uh, we have to have meetings with, if you've got uh, you know brick and mortar stores, we help with that. We help with the data center, pretty much everything. My focus was on automation, cloud, and virtualization. Uh, now I consult on AI products and strategy on top of, of course, my YouTube uh, channel. Um, and for those of you that are new, actually how my channel got started was a lot of coding tutorials, which if you go to my the homepage of my YouTube channel, I've, I've got it all in a, in, a, in a list. I've got like 50 or so coding tutorials still out there. Now, the reason that I made this video is because I had like three or four clients in a row basically ask the same or very similar questions. And so when that happens, I know that uh, this is resonating. Um, and then finally, I married a librarian. Uh, and so a lot of what we uh, talk about has to do with data and information, uh, storage, retrieval, curation, that sort of stuff. So I'm bringing a tremendous amount of, of uh, different disciplines and experience uh, in order to bring you this video. So here's before this is the last slide before we get started. I promise we're about to get in there. Um, but you need to know what kind of information I'm going to give you and how you need to use it. So uh, right up next, I'm going to give you a lot of concepts. So I understand that many of you watching are either CEOs, directors, managers, developers. Um, many of you probably don't know the first thing about librarianship or information science. Many of you probably don't know the first thing about philosophy and epistemics, which <laughs> you might be thinking, why is that even relevant? You will see. And then uh, some of you, many of you probably are from computer science and information technology. Um, so I'll be talking with you, basically translating all this into your language. Uh, or if you're a business leader, you might not know any of these disciplines. Uh, now, your mission, should you choose to accept it, you got to wrap your head around these concepts. You're probably going to need to watch this video several times. You might need to have chat GPT or Claude or Perplexity open on the side so you can uh, jot down concepts to follow up on. Um, but basically, we're going to push you towards being a transdisciplinary uh, <laughs> AI product design manager and strategist. Uh, so it'll take you a little while to integrate these ideas and to synthesize something new. So like I said, you probably want to download the slide deck. Um, uh, it's The slide decks are all available on my GitHub, uh, link in the description. You can also sign up on my Patreon. Um, I do consultation at any given time. I have about 20 clients. Um, and so I'm happy to uh, jump on a call with you to explain these concepts more specifically. Um, in the past, so this is for all you people that heard me in the past say that I don't sign NDAs, I've actually, um, I've contacted a lawyer friend and we're getting a consultation NDA set up. So I know that that has been a reason that many people have hesitated. Um, so uh, in the next week or two, I'll have a official NDA that I can sign that will uh, protect both of our interests because obviously I need to keep consulting with clients and I need to uh, make sure that I don't transfer any of my personal IP uh, while also protecting your IP. Okay, now 
We've laid all the groundwork. Let's get on to the show. Also, I apologize if the microphone phases in and out of existence. I'm trying to figure out how to mask that off. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> I do have a proper green screen behind me, which is why uh, I can gesture and the background doesn't um, glitch in and out of existence. All right, sorry. Tangent. Now for the concepts and solutions. There's about 10 or 15 slides here, so uh, buckle in and let's go through these. The first concept you need to know is data ontologies. Now, I'm not going to read all of these per se. Um, you can pause the video and read them, but most, mostly I'm just going to tell you, like, okay, when I say data ontology, what do I mean? Ontology is the, uh, philo the philosophical or epistemic uh, discipline of state of being. What does something actually exist as? And so this comes from database theory. It also comes from uh, philosophy and epistemics, which is basically, okay, if you had to characterize data and information in a vacuum or scientifically, this is what you would call your ontologies. So if you've got any database administrators or database engineers in your team, you can talk with them more about like what is a data ontology and how do you understand um, data? Because here's the thing is uh, many people who are new to generative AI they're thinking in terms of text and qualitative data, whereas you might be familiar with thinking in terms of quantitative data and relational databases. But data is data, um, and particularly your uh, data engineers, um, your data automation specialists, your data analysts, they're going to be able to understand and help you understand like what ontologies are. Um, so for instance, if you work with a lot of like squishy text data, like user comments or um, you know KB articles or stuff, that is still data. It is not relational mathematical data. And I know that there are going to be some purists out there who say, well, if it's not math, it's not data. But that's not really how the world works. So if you talk to uh, librarians, too, we'll, we'll love to talk to you about the different kinds of data and how to categorize them. All right, ne next up is you need to be familiar with the concepts of reconciliation and validation. So reconciliation often is, is a process that's more used in the finance side of your uh, business. And so you reconcile spreadsheets, you reconcile numbers. But reconciliation applies to literally every uh, discipline that has to deal with data, where you've got data coming from different sources with different levels of uh, validation, different levels of trustworthiness. Um, so, for instance, one of the products that my wife works on, oh, I forgot to mention, she she went from librarianship to um, to a data product owner. So, like, her experience is also directly relevant. So one of the products that she works on, they have uh, sources of information that come from vendors, but some of the information is wrong and it is hilariously wrong. And so they, they have to basically reconcile uh, multiple sources of data and say, okay, which, which data source are we going to hold as the source of truth? How do we validate it? Because, you know, <laughs> regard, <laughs> taking a step outside of language technology like LLMs, um, you have to do data validation regardless. Uh, <laughs> so hallucination is just a new kind of thing that you have to address. So another way to think of that is imagine that you've got various sources of information. You've got multiple internal sources of information. You might have vendors and APIs that you get information from. How do you, how do you cross validate and how do you reconcile those differences? So that's something that you can talk about. Um, like I said, uh, reconciliation is a really big thing in your finance department. So if you got any finance people, talk to them about how they reconcile different pieces of information uh, and different sources, and you'll get a, a tremendous amount of insight about how, you know, so for instance, like error detection, cleansing, all that sort of stuff, all the transformations that it goes through, so on and so forth. Uh, factual grounding. And so what factual grounding is, this is, this is uh, more from uh, philosophy, but it's also super, super, super important with language technology, which is you just need to state what your factual grounding is. What is the bedrock set of facts, data, and assertions that you're operating from? Um, so, you know, what data are you using? What empirical evidence? Where are your sources? Is it consistent? That sort of thing. Uh, but really just like think about when you're building either chatbots or other language technology, what is the factual grounding? And you have to be explicit. You have to give it the factual grounding. Even if it's just a few like, like sentence fragments where you say like X is true or assume Y is the case or uh, giving it some context like this is a construction company. It's amazing how much just a few little keywords will, will shape and steer language models. Because if you tell it like, hey, we're a Wall Street firm, like that's two words or three words, Wall Street firm versus like, you know, uh, you know, military um, hardware, you know, consultant. Those two, like just those two things give it so much context 
And it's going to perform a lot better by grounding whatever it's doing in some of those facts. So that's what I mean by factual grounding. Just give it really objective, empirical baseline, like what is what is going on? Because remember, you as a, as a person, you implicitly have all that factual grounding because you know your job. You see your physical surroundings. The language model exists in a tiny little bottle, bottled up brain out in the ether somewhere. So it has no context. Source of truth. So source of truth, this comes from, uh, well, I used it a lot in IT infrastructure because, uh, so say for instance, you've got uh, different login databases, you've got uh, different uh, user roles, you've got authentication uh, servers and that sort of stuff. So then you have to have a source of truth. Who is allowed to log into what? So this is like role-based access control. Uh, And so if you don't have a single source of truth, um, which you can end up... (laughs) Story from the front. If you give developers the keys to the kingdom, you end up with no single source of truth because developers generally don't understand authentication schemes. <laughs> and so you end up with local logins on every server or multiple key servers and that sort of thing. Uh, and that is bad because one, that is a security nightmare. Two, it is an access nightmare and so on and so forth. So this is why <laughs> accessibility, audit trails, data integrity, that sort of stuff. So source of truth. Uh, for any given data ontology or type, you need to identify who is the who is the key authority here. Um, so say say for instance you're getting a stock market data, right? There's going to be certain APIs like what is it the Eddy system um, where you can download you know all the financial filings from the SEC. That is a source of truth. That is what I mean by a source of truth. If you're trying to keep time, NIST is the is the source of truth for the current time. But why? Because they sync their clocks to all the nuclear clocks around the world. So by identifying sources of truth for each piece of information, you can establish layers of truthfulness and reliability and validity. And uh, you can also establish some internal sources of truth. So say, for instance, you have like a master KB article or a set of documents that is well curated and you say, if there's ever any disagreement, default to this. It's like having a constitution, right? This is how America makes uh, judicial decisions is that the Constitution is held up as the ultimate source of truth, and then there's layers of truthiness below the U.S. Constitution. Um, Axiomatic principles. So axiomatic principles are the uh, are the core assertions, the first the first uh, principles or the fundamental assumptions that you're making um, when you're doing a particular business task or working with certain information. And so one thing that I recommend people doing is any assumptions that you're making, say them out loud. Tell the the model that like, hey, assume that X is true or assume that this is the the ethical framework that we're using when we're making this decision. Or, um, you know, one of the things that we're operating on is like this model of SEO. Because if you just say like, write an optimized web page, it'll, it'll do its best. But then if you say, write an SEO optimized web page according to this theory, right? By, by giving the model axiomatic principles, you're going to get much better results that are adherent to specific paradigms, schools of thought, that sort of thing. And this applies to whatever business domain you're in, um, whether you're doing uh, copywriting, whether you're doing hospitals, whether you're in, and also which country you're in. Um, so different countries have different uh, regulations. And so if you say adhere to like, you know, the cultural norms of Sweden, these are the, you know, these are the cultural axiomatic beliefs that we're operating by when you interact with your users or whatever. Uh, okay. So next data taxonomy. So taxonomy, the, the most familiar taxonomy that people are familiar with is the, uh, is the, the taxonomy of life, right? So you've got you know, the, the, the five kingdoms of life, and then you've got various phyla and order below that. And so what you can do is you can create data taxonomies that are very similar where you've got, you know, basically nested categories where like at the highest level of your AI infrastructure or data infrastructure, you've got like, is this a financial record? Is this an employee record or whatever? Uh, you, you can generally follow uh, kind of the department's because each department is can be considered a, a data domain um, or a, do, a domain of expertise. And then, of course, each department may be subdiv- further subdivided. And this is not necessarily, I'm not saying like put it in a file system. This is really good for metadata. And if you have a standardized taxonomy that you can use across your entire organization, this is a non-trivial problem. 
But imagine how um, Linnaeus felt when he was trying to create a taxonomy for literally all life on Earth. If you treat your business's data and you say, we're going to come up with a singular taxonomy for literally every piece of data in our company, that's going to really increase the searchability um, in the future, which is going to make it much more accessible to all of your AI technology. A classification system. So a classification system is very similar to a taxonomy. And so the, the two most familiar classification systems that you're going to be familiar with in terms of information are going to be the Dewey Decimal System, which is a way of just rapidly bucketing, hey, this piece of information, here's a number that just kind of gives it a rapid category. The other one that's a little bit more comprehensive is the Library of Congress, which is also which is a more taxonomical system because it has some, some nested hierarchies. Um, now, the advantages here is that uh, this allows you to address novel pieces of information. So whether you have a very rigid taxonomy uh, in which like you're saying like, hey, this is the structure in which we put we we slot literally everything in our business, or you have a more general purpose classification system that says, hey, given the context of this piece of information, where it came from, what it's for, this is its classification. Again, you can use both of these in your metadata, which uh, is going to add more layers of how do you use this. Data curation. So uh, one thing that a lot of people have asked me about is like version control. And so uh, having married a librarian and talking about uh, like archival studies and reference librarianship and all that for fun, kind of fun stuff, um, <laughs> I know, and what you were probably discovering is that data curation is a non-trivial task. Uh, data gets updated over time. It gets invalidated. It comes from different sources. And so this is why I, I talk so much about librarianship is because you basically have to have your master collection. And, you know, you, you might keep the older books or the older documents that are out of date, but then you need metadata to say, hey, this is out of date. This has expired. Um, if you use ServiceNow, uh, ServiceNow actually has settings where you can have KB articles automatically expire. It's one of the most annoying things <laughs> for people who have like, no, this is a permanent KB article, and then it like automatically archives it. But the idea is that uh, data and information has an expiration date. Um, or it might have an expiration date, and you need to be explicit about this. Um, and so this is what I mean by data curation. And so by by constantly updating your collection, updating the tags, updating the metadata, updating the expiration dates, this is gonna, these are all going to be clues that allow you to sift through and say, okay, well, if we have two otherwise identical articles, trust the more recent one. Or if we have two, you know, like, relatively identical articles, trust the one that came from the, the more trusted source of truth. ETL. So ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. This is a this is a data warehousing where it basically, um, this, is, this is how you move data around the data warehouse, which is why I imagine this nice futuristic data warehouse with heavy equipment moving data around. Uh, and so ETL, is an existing practice that uh, your data people are going to be familiar with. And now generative AI is just going to be a new tool for them to move data around their data warehouses. Um, it's going to give them more options in terms of transformations of the data. Uh, it's going to give them more options in terms of validating the data, automating the data processing, and that sort of thing. So again, this is an established business practice that you can just research and say, oh, generative AI is just a new tool in this bucket and it's an existing uh, discipline. And then finally, information foraging. So this one comes from information science. Uh, so information foraging, everyone, if you exist today, you know what information foraging is. You might not have the, um, the word for it. So information foraging is when you go out into an information environment looking for information and you're not exactly sure what you're looking for, but you have an information need and you're trying to solve that information need. And so then you go to your favorite favorite hunting grounds, whether it's Google or YouTube or you know, you've know you got a, a, a Discord or Slack channel that you go ask questions. And so then information foraging is something that you're actually going to have to automate and enable your autonomous agents, your chatbots, and your other generative AI cognitive architectures to be able to engage in information foraging. Because they're going to have an information need um, you know, in order to serve a, a user query or whatever. And so then it's like, okay, well, where do they go looking for that information? 
Uh, is the information spoon-fed to them by automatic search queries? Does the agent have a model where it's able to say, hey, I need this kind of information. Where can I go find it? That sort of thing. Okay, so I just threw a whole lot of, co of uh, complex concepts at you. Uh, it's like drinking from the fire hose. You're probably going to need to watch this several times or go check out the slide deck and do a lot of Googling. Now let's get to the practical implementation. All right, so the, the number one thing absolutely that I recommend to literally every customer is start with a data-centric model. Um, so this is based on the von, uh, von Neumann architecture of computing where uh, computing happens in memory and then the memory is uh, operated on by computation. But really the, the, the center of it is your data. It is your information. Treat all uh, of your business processes and tasks as fundamentally as information problems. So basically you have information flowing into your organization or circulating around your organization and then flowing out of your organization. And that information can be um, any kind of information. It can be a bill that needs to be paid. It can be a customer query. It can be regulatory requirements. Literally everything you do is fundamentally an information problem and there are information needs. And I uh, apologize, I meant to add information needs as one of the concepts. So let me do that real quick. I've said information needs a few times. So information needs comes from the world of librarianship where anytime a patron walks into a library, the reason that they walk into the library and go to the circulation desk is because they have an information need. Now, that information need, talk to a librarian. They have the most hilarious stories. Those information needs could be anything from there's a snake in the lobby, what do I do about it? To there's a three-year-old throwing up in the kids section to I'm looking for a book on like, you know, penis enhancement or whatever. Librarians get the weirdest thing. So they, they you, uh, a, a, a client or a customer or a patron comes to you with an information need and then there is a process to one, figure out what that information need truly is and then serve that information need. So by treating literally everything that happens in your company as an information need, um, you're going to really change your orientation to it because then what is the outcome? Also, the outcome, um, if you use the librarianship model, is very clear. The patron walks away with the piece of information that they need, the book that they need, or their problem is solved, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's number one of the data centric model. Number two, information thy God, um, in, in, uh, the fiction space for us, novel writers, we have this phrase that says, um, thy God, the reader, <laughs> which is basically, we might be writing for ourselves, but it's ultimately the reader that's going to decide what it is that we write and do and what succeeds. And in this case, information and data, that is your God. Because everything in your business is an information problem, information is the actual thing that you are serving in order to provide the goods and services that make your company viable. So goods and services are the, the output, that's the economic interface between your company and the world, but information is how you do that, and information is how you do that well. Um, so another way to think about this is data is the new oil. So information thy God, data is the new oil. By adopting a data-centric approach to literally every um, good service, process, protocol, task, um, you'll have a better understanding of how uh, generative AI can intersect and augment your business. And then finally, this is just a really kind of boilerplate um, way to think about what generative AI can do. And this, these are the types of transformations that generative AI can do. So there's three fundamental types. And the way that you can categorize it is what is, what is the size of the input versus the size of the output? So there's shrinking operations or shrinking transformations, which is summarization, extraction, and classification. So you put in a big chunk of text and you get out a small chunk of text. That is that. The second type is translation or, tra or other transformation, where this, the, the input size and the output size is roughly the same. Um, and so in this case, this might be a format change. It might be changing to another language. So for instance, you might translate from like XML to JSON. That's a translation example. You might translate it from English to Japanese. That's a translation example. Um, another example from for a shrinking thing is evaluation. And so I forgot to, I forgot to add that. But a, sh a shrinking operation is, um, I use this extensively in using Claude and ChatGPT to provide feedback. So feedback and critique is another example of a shrinking transformation where it's like, assess the quality of this thing. Give me critique. And so the output is smaller than the input. And then finally, uh, expanding. The input is smaller than the output. 
And so this is stuff like brainstorming, synthesizing, drafting, um, being creative, uh, you know, drafting prose, which Claude can do that sometimes, but I, <laughs> but I tell it not to because uh, it's really hot on the biscuit to just draft whatever it wants and it is not good um, often. Uh, but you can draft legal documentation. You can draft KB articles. So by understanding that you have these three fundamental types of data transformations that is available to you through generative AI, then you can subcategorize, okay, what other operations do we have access to? Maybe I'll do a video on the, on all the different kinds of operations, and I'll create my own uh, generative AI data transformation taxonomy. Okay, search strategies. So there are four fundamental search strategies that are available to you today with generative AI. And so basically, as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, you have information needs as a person, as a business, your chatbots have information needs, your users have information needs, everyone has user information needs, and we talked about information foraging. So these are the, the actual strategies, the techniques that you can use to approach your information foraging problems. Now the first one obviously is vector search. You're probably watching this video because you realize that vector search is not cutting the mustard anymore. So there's a few primary things that people don't understand about vector search. Vector search is not like Google, and it is not like SQL, where uh, vector search, uh, people try and treat it like query document. So where you have like, uh, in SQL, you might have a, a, a specific, you know, structured query, like find everything that includes X, Y, and Z um, with, you know, A, B, and C criteria. For Google, you're kind of matching, you know, keywords to a document. But really what vector search really shines for is clustering similar documents. And so what I mean by that is that uh, in order, like, here's, here's a perfect example. Documents with similar formats and similar contexts are going to be the best thing to kind of cluster and use. So take, imagine that you're a scientist and you're looking for like every paper that is similar to a paper you're looking at. So for literature review, you say, hey, give me every paper like this one. So you feed them, you feed the vector search an entire paper. Of, you know, you vectorize an entire paper, and then it's going to find everything that is semantically similar to that paper, um, and it's going to be perfect. So that is one of the primary things that vector search that people get wrong about vector search. Yes, there are vectors and embeddings that are made for for a query document matching, but those are not good. Um, they might get good in the future, but that but from a mathematical perspective, that is not what vector searching is for. Vector searching is more for clustering similar things together. You might do the same thing for uh, KB articles. So imagine that like you know you have an internal KB system and you bring up a KB article and then at the end it's like here's the five most similar KB articles. And so rather than than clustering similar KBs or similar scientific papers, um, or other documentation on keywords or other things, you can cluster them based on what's actually written on the page. Um, this can also be useful for things like uh, fictional documents. So some people keep you know piles and piles and piles of fictional documents together, and so then it's like, hey, you know, uh, I've got this this character sheet and this chapter. You know, find find all the other chapters like this other chapter, uh, that sort of thing. Number two is knowledge graphs. So knowledge graphs are kind of a hybrid between relational databases and some of these, these squishier, more web-like things. Um, the, the, if you're not familiar with knowledge graphs, probably the easiest way to think about a knowledge graph is think of a Wik Wikipedia page where Wikipedia has references and crosslinks to other pages, and each of those crosslinks has a semantic meaning. There's a reason that, you know, that the uh, Eiffel Tower page is linked to the Paris France page. And so that is what I mean by knowledge graphs. So like a knowledge graph is just basically the web <laughs> with, a, with a little bit more like, you know, whatever. Anyways, you can use language technology to create, traverse, and reach knowledge graphs. I know that there's going to be some purists out there saying that that's not what it is at all. But from a functional standpoint, a knowledge graph is just a web of content. Um, number three is metadata filtering. So most vector search databases have uh, the ability to filter based on metadata. Um, and certainly, you know, relational databases do as well. And so this is why I talked so much about metadata and data curation is because uh, if you have, you know, vector search collections um, and you're, you're surfacing things that are not necessarily relevant, it's because you're searching documents, you're, you're surfacing documents that are very similar 
to what your search query is, but they're not necessarily relevant because you don't have the correct ontologies or taxonomy or classification system where it's like, okay, do you know, do a search with this vector, but I only want you know this particular type of data, this particular category. And then finally, number four is indexes or a table of contents. So this is something that, as far as I know, I pioneered um, in some of my coding experiments. But basically, you you generate a table of contents or a menu that your that your language model can choose from, and it says, "Oh, I need you know this KB article," and then it you know it can request and fetch that specific KB article. Where basically you're kind of cutting out the middleman instead of having semantic search, you're saying, "Hey." Read this, read this document, read this menu, read this uh, table of contents, tell me which information you need, I'll go get it, and then you can have like nested layers of tables of contents and whatever. This may or may not pan out as useful, but in the experiments that I've done with it, it's been uh, extremely useful because then with the given context of whatever information problem your uh, language model is facing, it will be able to say, this is probably what I need access to. Uh, the next thing for practical implementation is a gated process. So there's many things that you can do in one step. And of course, like uh, if you ask the machine learning engineers and scientists, the AI is going to be able to do everything in one step one day. But uh, from a business perspective, first, just no. And even from a biological perspective, that's not how human brains work. Um, we all have internal workflows and processes, even if you're not fully conscious of them. And so there's three primary steps that you can think of for addressing any information need. Um, first is the, uh, is the information query. So in that example that I gave you for uh, someone approaching the circulation desk at a library, um, there's what's called the reference interview, which librarians use to figure out what, uh, what, the, what the patron needs. So like, what is your question? What, what is the context behind your question? What is, what is the outcome you're looking for? Is it a valid request? Right, because if you walk up to the circulation desk and you say like, "Hey, like you know something's happening on the other side of the city," the librarian might be like, "Okay, that sounds important, but I can't help you." Um, so number one is the first gate is the information query. You you judge the valid the the validity of it. Is it an appropriate question? Is it information that we can actually serve or not? Number two is distill, extract, and utilize. So this is imagine when you go get a stack of books. The library, you know, you've you've talked to the librarian, you've got a legitimate information query, and then you go get a stack of books. So then what you do is you take a dozen books and you flip through them and you take notes, you copy the pages that you need, and you compile the most salient bits of information so that now you have uh, you've you've consolidated the information that you need to actually solve your information problem. And then finally, format and deliver. Let's let's imagine that you went to the library to help you with. Um, uh, filing building plans for a new house, right? So while you're at the library, you got all the code books, you got all the architectural diagrams, you got it all copied. Now what you do is you package it up and send it out to the architect or you send it out um, to the inspector or whatever. So that's what I mean by inspect, uh, or sorry, the query, distill, extract, utilize, and then format and deliver. Um, by using a gated process with, with uh, you know, checkpoints, decision points, workflows, but by, by treating them as, as fundamentally different phases and handoff processes, you're going to have a lot more better uh, results with your automation. And then finally, assembly lines. Look at all of your business, whether it's internal or external, whether it's customer facing or not. Everything that you do is work tasks and work products moving through an assembly line. Now, it's a digital assembly line. Sometimes it's a verbal assembly line, but... If you, if you look at your business as a collection of assembly lines, you're going to have a much better way of automating it. So there's a few primary components of assembly lines. One is inputs. Where do work items come from? Where do the materials come from? Where does the information come from? Emails, calls, bills, API calls. Does it come from vendors? Does it come from users? Does it come from internal stakeholders? There's always inputs to every assembly line. And again, like I said, there's going to be multiple assembly lines. Number two, there's stations. The whole point of an assembly line is that you quickly move work products or work items or materials um, from one station to the next. And de de uh, deciding which station it goes to next is one part of the problem, but then also what information tools and transformations are done at that station. So for instance, in uh, automobile assembly lines, you know, the first part is you build the frame, then you start bolting on the, you know, the motor and the electronics, and then you put in the wiring, and then finally you paint it. 
So like you have the painting station, you have the welding station, you have the, the engine station, that sort of thing. So think about the stations of your business. You know, where do, when does a work product move from procurement to material handling? When does, when does it move from uh, finance to billing to wherever else it goes? Um, interfaces. So look at the interfaces. So an interface is a handoff point. This is when it changes from one person or one department to another. Is it coming from your vendor to your CFO? Is it going from your finance department to your IT department? That's what I mean by interfaces. And then finally, outputs. What is the final result of a, of a given work product or process? Is it that a bill gets paid? Is, that, is it that a, a patient gets discharged from the hospital? Is it that you know, um, material is delivered on site and then you're, you know, it's out of your hands? What are the input stations, interfaces, and outputs? Treat it all like information moving through a digital assembly line or a digital factory, and you will be able to start working towards those um, polymorphic applications that I talked about in a previous video. All right, thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Like I said, links, uh, all the most important links are in the description. Uh, cheers, have a good one. Reach out on LinkedIn and Patreon. I'm happy to help you out. Have a good one.